Stash Podcast. Growers who are looking for that secret sauce usually are just missing something from their garden. And to help with that, we bring you the Stash Blend Premium Plant Additive. Stash Blend brings beneficial bacteria, silicon, seaweed, humic acid, and has enough macro nutrition to help lower the dosages of your base feed too. Unleash your plant's true potential with Stash Blend Premium Plant Additive. Available at Grower's House. A huge shout out to AC Infinity. They recently released their humidifier. This is an easy top fill system that allows you to adjust the moisture levels from the outside of your tent. It connects to the controller 69, which makes things so much easier to use. You can follow it on your app. You can see it from outside the tent without ever having to step inside. If you head over to acinfinity.com, use promo code THESTASH15, you can save a few dollars off not only the humidifier, but all of their products. And while you're at it, thank them for being a sponsor of today's video. Yo, boys, good to see you. Welcome hey. back. What's up? It's another week, another day of conversation. It feels great to be here, boys. Feels good to be here. Absolutely, man. I feel like we used to always, every time, be like, from the Stash Podcast, and now it's just like, what up? <laughs> What up? Been here long enough. It, right? <laughs> it just helps. It helps that we were sitting here talking the whole time, and then we just—it's like uh, let's just pivot the conversation out to something else. Let's go. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Man, we uh, we put out a video not too long ago, uh, video or audio episode, depending if you're listening or watching, discussing longer flowering cultivars. Basically, things that take longer to finish, whether it be your traditional sativa or just a, a hybrid or a cultivar that takes longer. There's the other side of things, the full other side of the spectrum, and that's the shorter flowering cultivars. And that's really sought after by a lot of people, especially in the commercial space or anybody who's cash cropping or just wants to have multiple harvests in a shorter period of time. I feel like this is one thing we haven't talked about, oddly enough, and uh, today's the day. Let's do it. Yeah, I feel like most of the common ones are eight-weekers or nine-weeker flowering cultivars, right? And that's the most common. That's what a lot of people are go going after or just happen to get. Um, you know, like you said, we already talked about the longer flowering 10, 11, 12 plus weekers. Uh, that was a real fun conversation. I mean, there's lots of diff things you can do differently in the grow for those types. You know, we talked about like longer stretching period, for example, and what you can do feeding differently and so on and so forth. But yeah, the shorter side of things, I mean, there's stuff that finishes quicker than eight weeks. You know, one that comes right off the mind, uh, right to my mind right away is Pakistan Valley by World of Seeds. So that's something I used in my um, Chill Out OG cross. I crossed uh, Brisker OG, had a male of that, and then crossed it with a Pakistan Valley. And one of the things that I really liked about it is that it was so quick to flower. I mean, I'm looking at uh, Seed Finder right now. Uh, flowering time is 45 to 55 days. So very quick flowering. And um, yeah, there's definitely some things that need to be treated differently when you're growing. Um, in order to make sure you're growing them successfully. So. You're, you're totally right. And what's wonderful is that there's a proliferation of new gardeners out there all over the planet. There, it's whether you're f from the northern regions of Canada to some of the southern regions of uh, South America. You know, you've got people growing all over the planet. And in my particular region, you don't have a whole lot of time to flower your plants. You typically can't get a bean in the ground until June 1st. That's kind of the rule of thumb. And harvest comes, or at least winter comes, mid to late October, where it's not unusual to see snow. So we want to make sure that we are getting these flowers done and done quickly. And, you know, there's just some people that want to uh, just have a quick flower so that they can get that perpetual garden going over and over again. Um, do you have any favorites, Rob? One that I grew years ago, man, it was, uh, there was purple skunk mass and critical, oh, was it critical hog mass? But the, the purple skunk mass was one that I had finishing up in 49 days. I believe it was the purple skunk mass. Uh, I had those over on CLTV if anybody was OGs and know those ones. But I didn't like the smoke, but I was just astonished the fact that it finished in such a short period of time. I didn't expect it to. It, it said it would, but I still went into it skeptical. And it was weird because it was essentially like a fast flowering where that big stretch that you normally get in those first two to three weeks, I was seeing a start uh, of growth essentially for flowers my my nodes were exploding in about a week and a half i was like whoa what's going on here like auto like but it was more the fact because it had less time to grow so it still packed on and grew and yielded well it just i didn't continue to grow it because it wasn't what i was after there's a ton of different 
strains out there, cultivars out there. I mean, I'm looking at a list right now. Actually, if you search uh, short flowering strains, you'll see a whole list here. I mean, I already named off Pakistan Valley. Northern Light, that's actually a, a six to seven weaker by uh, the Sensi Seeds version of that. Big Nugs, Fast, um, that's another six to seven weaker. Quick, quick Critical Plus, which is by Dynafem. Um, we've got Green Poison, Ganja Dwarf, some of these I haven't even heard of. <laughs> we've got the uh, Royal CBDV Automatic. Um, the list goes on. Blueberry Muffin. Uh, I didn't know the Blueberry Muffin was a fast flowering one. That seems to become more and more popular these days. Yeah. And then uh, Quick Mass, which is a cross between White Widow X and Critical Mass. Um, so all these are listed as like fast flowering, um, which is really what we're talking about is like below eight weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, one that I saw actually, that I'm, I'm gone mentally now. I remember is Monster Mass. That was it. That one was done in 46 days total. I, it was finished, ready to go. I mean, it was it was crazy. I was blown away by it. That was from a Critical Mass Collective. Got those years ago, and phew, I, I was astonished with that growth. And I know there's a lot of cultivars that are coming out more and more with that focus because of the commercial settings that are out around the world now. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's a lot of runts. A lot of runts are fast flowering. Wedding cake, I believe, is fast flowering. Uh, I uh, quite honestly, I believe the new market is pushing towards fast flowering product. Um, in my opinion, for obvious reasons, but I think there's a detriment to that. You know, you've got companies. There's a new bank around, if I'm not mistaken, um, Fast Buds. They've they've in, Curate, curated an entire business plan around fast flowering plants. Now I'm trying to I'm trying to play with that word there, and I'm sure we all know why. Um, but they have uh, they've they're pushing a lot of the cookies, the runs, the wedding cakes. I feel as if that's really where the market's driving. It's the fastest way to get to profit. It's the quickest way to get your plants to to the shelf. You know, from the production line to the shelf. But I do believe, as I mentioned, there's a detriment to that. And I believe the reason I I say this is because I will not forget, um, oh, from from 420 Vape Zone. Um, what was his what was his name? Sorry, guys. Troy. Troy. I, I knew it was Troy. I didn't want to say it. Um, Troy made a very good point, And I will stick to this for a very long time based on his his vaping knowledge. And that was that. You know, we've we've focused so long on THC, and now you could argue CBD that we've probably or perhaps have kind of diminished the potency or the array of other cannabinoids. I think the same thing is true when we jeopardize or not jeopardize when we limit the flowering time. There has to be terpenes and cannabinoids that aren't being say fully developed, or maybe that are are more present in fast flowering you know because maybe there's a spectrum of terpenes and you know so maybe some maybe like it's like it's a ph meter there's some particular terpenes that are more prevalent earlier on in the development of thc or in the development of cannabinoid uh sure the trichome and then maybe there's different uh cannabinoids and terpenes that are profile we already know this to be true but to how much to what to what extent i'd be really curious and when we when you're growing these faster flowering things i mean we i don't know if we'll probably be jumping all over the place on this episode right but like treating them as a seedling and veg and is different flower and uh you know if you flush that's a different conversation you know you gotta be sure when to flush early and stuff like that but maybe we kind of start with like training of the plants because they can be treated a little bit differently uh personally me growing faster flowering i found that they're um, a little bit shorter on the shorter side at least the, the plants that i've grown so um you know kind of limiting training a little bit i found to be more beneficial because if i top the plant great i'll get the side branching coming out but if i'm topping again i could slow down a little bit too much um, now of course if it's a photo period you can just veg for a longer period of time and get the the, the plant to the size you want but uh, but it can be a little bit more challenging to uh, if you're topping more or pulling branches down more because when you do do that flip to flower, um, you may not get as much of a stretch as you would with a normal you know eight or nine weeker or even a longer flowering strain. That's one thing we we called out in our longer flowering cultivars video is that those ones stretch for four weeks sometimes even longer than that right. But on average three 
mostly four weeks. Uh, so you got to account for that. Now with these slower flowering ones, you might not get as much of a stretch, maybe seven, 14 days. So it could be a quick ending stretch. So you might flip the flower and it might not stretch up as much as you're anticipating to. So that's something definitely to kind of keep in mind uh, because certainly knowing that information, you're going to be able to adjust the way you train the plant. Yeah, that's that's a very good point too. And, and a lot of those cultivars won't have that, that crazy stretch. So that double trellising that a lot of girls do won't necessarily be as effective. It'll be usually shorter and squattier, the traditional indica cultivars, we'll call it. And I think that now with, again, all the hybrids, it's changing. It's like if you find a dominant parent that the growth traits come through and then the uh, the other parent that essentially brings the actual flowering and product trait to come through, you could probably get a lot of those blends that'll still get what you're looking for and just speeding up that time. But I know in the commercial setting of the years of, uh, you know, looking for different terps and things like that, that was osamine. I believe it's osamine. It was one that only in the 11 to 12 weekers did we ever see come back in, in the actual certificates uh, of analysis to see for terpene testing. And it was never anything that was lower than that. So it seems like potentially, this is all bro science and, and hypothesis, is that the cultivars that take longer to grow may be able to produce those terpenes like P was talking. And to be able to do that training and to catch it to, to get those expressions that you want when something's limited like that well not only are you going to limit potentially your yield but then you're potentially your quality and it's not always this is just in a case of seeing a lot that's already been out there is you're hindering two sides yield and that that terpene you're looking for now there is of course like I'm not just blowing fast buds up constantly but i've seen like grower joe growing the orange sherbet and yeah. the bud structure was solid it was a big nice plant and when it's a photo period you can choose how big you want to veg it so that's where you can still get some of those sides but you can't think as it flips to flower you can still tackle it like you would just like chris said it's it's going to change so but depending on what you're looking for you're really going to approach it different as a fast flowering cultivar for you or is it not for you in your space I think you. I, I really. I, I've kind of you know knocked on auto flowers in the past, and you know I. I my my opinion of them still stands true. I. I you know I, I. I. They're not for me. I do believe that there is an like uh, there is a a cultivar for everyone, and that's why you know there's there has been a prevalence or a, a proliferation of these genetics. It's just I. I feel as if like it's a lot of them are turning auto flower. Uh, rather than being fast flowering and there is a there is a difference there is a difference between a faster flowering rather than an auto flower um and and i think having a fast flowering plant is a little bit more beneficial not only to a, a grower but to the you know um the preservation of genetics whereas i've always said auto flowers is kind of where genetics go to die so if if we can keep you know the, uh, if we can keep fast flowering plants alive, I think that's more beneficial. But you know, it's just my—that's my opinion. I think that's where the layer of, of the self-sufficient side of becoming the breeder who knows how to make autos. So that way, once you learn how to get it, you can retain that genetic for yourself. That's you know, crapping on the market for the people who are trying to make profit off it. But at the same time, the only way to keep it is in that sense. That's learning how to make autos yourself, and then you always consistently have those. When it comes down to the fast flowering versus auto flowering. Those are two areas that I think a lot of people are attracted to because you can get it quick. But with that quickness, you sacrifice other things. Like I was saying earlier, I think auto flowers, the biggest thing is you sacrifice guaranteeing that exact same end product because you have to go restart every single time. As we're just a fast flowering cultivar, you can clone that and keep it going and perfect the way you want to grow that. If you know it doesn't have that stretch now, well, that three week uh, default you're going to do before is probably out of the, the question. You may change up your time period, but you didn't know that the first time. Your auto... Well, hopefully that next plant grows the same way as that last auto did, and it's all the same, so that way you take the information from the last one you grew and bring it to the next. So I think people have to really think if they'd rather have fast flowering or auto flowering for that reason. Like you said, genetics go to die. It's just a new experience every time. What about feeding? I know feeding, uh, some people say uh, you might want to treat them a little bit differently. When it comes to the flaster flower, we already talked about again, kind of referring to our longer flowering, uh, lots of differences when it comes to feeding. But how about shorter? Is there as many differences in feeding? I think that depends on what you're using. If you're using synthetic, you can just add it and it's ready to go. But if you're doing something that takes time to break down, like an organic input, like two weeks, let's say, and you're adding a flowering uh, top feed to there, 
you may need to hit it quicker than you would anticipate because you don't have as long of a time that you normally would. You don't have the point where that plant's going to absorb more nitrogen early on because it's already flipping into flower and wants to draw back. So it may make you change your whole approach knowing that because, well, your plant may not turn out like you want, stretchy and gangly and weird. Or you have the uh, uh, synthetic inputs or the liquid-based ones that you can hit to the T exactly how you want. And knowing that you're going to be pulling in two weeks, you may want to decide to taper off and do a leaching like we talk about or, you know, flushing if you bro science it. So I think that would really be a, or not, you know, you know what I mean. I think that would be a great great way to test it out because again that cultivar may react different with these new hybrids and these new fast flowering ones versus the traditionals what do you think p yeah um i i, I personally am synthetic you guys know this uh I, I i do get this question a lot in regards should i be feeding my autos differently than my photos i my general answer is no just whatever week it's at feed it those nutrients but when you've got something that is flowering in you know six to seven weeks i'm generally asking okay well are you getting those phosphor are you you know are you getting those final inputs those last um those last couple week inputs you know your phosphoruses and your your sugars and these are things that i want to make sure that if it's done in seven weeks well I only just cut up my Kelmeg at my, in my calcium in, at week six. So the week before I harvest, I just cut out, cut out my Kelmeg. So no, you can't, you can't do that. You, you would, in my opinion, I should be cutting that out at least two or three weeks before harvest. So on a six, seven weeker, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to be watching my inputs. I'm going to be watching my inputs. You know, it's not, yeah, Chris, I'm really glad you, you, you brought this up because there is, there, there would be a difference. There would be a difference. So you've That's really got to get those inputs in. And, and really important, too, this is where all us Kumbaya guys are like, well, listen to your plants, man. And, uh, you know, that's that's exactly what I would be doing. Um, if if they're coming out really, really dark, well, what, what's happening? It's too much. If they're coming out a little light and a little crisp, well, maybe it's not enough. You, so you got to listen to your plants, man. I was going to come with the hippie kumbaya stuff, so I'm glad you said that. I was going to say that's where it's good to know your plants because you can read your plants and the signs will be different because you're like, okay, it's finishing up a lot faster than I realized. That happened um, with one of the purple frost giants that I grew from Welcome to the Grow Tent. Shout out to GT. Shut up. One of them randomly was finishing way quicker than the others, and it was only because I knew the finishing look of a plant. I'm not a total beginner, and I'm, I can identify these things. I feel like even as a rookie, you should start to look at common signs of uh, deficiencies and toxicities, so that way you can judge if your plant's in the right stage, if it's, if it's starting to decay or look funky or change up the way it's morphing, let's say. You'll know that it's probably based on what you're doing and the inputs that you're giving it. And I think it's good to know, if it's a fast-flowering cultivar, how you would treat it in that short window could vary because again that plant is going to tell you it's going to let you know whoa it's too much back off or hey i'm hungry i need more it's good the hippie stuff the kumbaya works really well it does yeah for me uh feeding kind of with synthetics mineral based bottled nutrients um you don't want to grow in those faster flowering ones really you know i first of all i refer to the schedule feeding schedule um, usually I do a half dose or quarter dose um, throughout the grow, depending on, you know, reading the plant, seeing how it takes it and so on and so forth. Uh, oftentimes looking at the runoff PPM or EC um, to kind of get an idea of how much to feed. Uh, but I do follow the chart, you know, up uh, through, fe- through veg. And then when you flip it over to flower, though, something to keep in mind is that it might be a little bit off compared to what the feeding schedule is telling you, right? So, for example, like uh, the, for the folks that believe in flushing, um, you know, if you flush two weeks prior, and just to clarify on flushing, this is here in 2023, it's still a, a highly debated topic. People are very adamant that it works. Some people are very adamant that it doesn't work. So if you believe in flushing, uh, I'll just keep it at that, whether it be cutting off nutrients or actually running water through the, the, the grow pot before harvest at some point, whether it be one or two weeks prior, keep that in mind that, hey, yours is going to finish in six or seven weeks. You're going to want to flush potentially week five, you know. Um, now, some people would certainly argue against that. Uh, I know a lot of people say, hey, feed all the way up until the end. You know, just watch that that PPM. But, again, if you are a flusher, that's something just to keep in mind. Uh, another thing I want to mention with uh, the synthetic nutrients is um, a common practice that uh, you know, quite a few people do and I started doing was, like, cutting off CalMag at a certain point. 
um, specifically when you're in veg and you're going into flour and you feel like you may be on the verge of nitrogen toxicity. Now with CalMag, I've mentioned this in, in past podcast episodes, uh, a lot of them have nitrogen in it. So it's a way to, for nitrogen to kind of sneak into your regimen without you knowing. So if you're going into flowering and you're already kind of on the verge of nitrogen toxicity, some people will cut back CalMag entirely. Um, and then that way their their plant will grow just fine. Um, of course, if you're going into flowering and you're continuing flowering with nitrogen toxicity, um, longer inner nodes, uh, loose area buds can occur. I've had that happen. It's really overfeeding. It's the worst time you can do the overfeeding, really. Um, you know, I've had plants, unfortunately, that I had to kind of scrap. You know, I, I thought they were, looked weird at week four. Week five, I'm like, what's going on with these? I didn't really know back then. Um, and then I get to harvest and it's just, it's gross. You know, I tried to rebound, tried to back up off the new nitrogen. Um, but then product was just so undesirable that I ended up, I tried to turn it into like, uh, you know, dry ice hash and stuff. But I mean, it's still, it's just, it wasn't there for me. Um, so anyways, that's synthetic. <laughs> A couple things to kind of keep in mind, at least that I keep in mind for shorter flowering cultivars. On the organic side of things, it's uh, pretty similar to what I'm doing now. It's just, you know, general approach that a lot of people do is they'll amend their uh, medium to begin, right? So they're using soil, they'll do the initial amending. And then before fl flipping the flower, they'll do another amending, you know, top dressing. Um, the organic blends are so common now where they'll just top dress it on top. Maybe add in some word castings as well on top, which is something that I do. So they're watering in like at flower or like a couple days before flower. Then uh, 20 or 30 days into it, you know, mostly it's 30 days is generally when you'll do another top dressing. But with these shorter flowering ones, 20 days might be what some people choose to do instead because um, they're going to be finishing around the 45 to you know, 55 day mark, for example. So, yeah, it can be definitely be a little, little bit different um, when it comes to uh, feeding for shorter flowering ones. Isn't it crazy we live in a day and age where if you believe in science... <laughs> like, what the fuck is, i'm still stuck on that like all 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 gems but do you believe in science nah nah in 2023 no no i think there's a lot Hot of misconception Walsh. because like it's it it really comes down to like overfeeding like back in the day when people are flushing it's just because they're, they're pumping their plants full of nutrients you know what i mean it's like okay now let's try to get rid of it so the final product will be better you know so it's yeah like, it was a fix I just think it wasn't a, a lot process. of misconceptions still with with that process in particular absolutely absolutely it's a good point though and i think when you're looking at that it's kind of going into that flushing your uh or finishing your fast flowering cultivars that's going to be a little different for everybody as well because those signs you're looking for are going to come earlier than someone's like well around week six week seven you'll start to see like you can't look at those numbers anymore when you're looking at general plant information on the internet that's where you kind of need to know like okay well i'm skipping two weeks potentially so this stretch time it's starting earlier so almost like disregard those first two weeks that's where a lot of people like i've said before in other episodes is when you start flowering is when you start to see the nodes develop into buds that's when a lot of people will say this is flowering now it's not so much it's just when you fl flip to 12 12 is when flowering starts but when you're dealing with a in a short flowering cultivar, you may want to do that. With auto, that's usually what you do. It's flowering once it's automatically flowering. You're not just like, well, I know in two weeks it's going to start flowering, so we're going to call it flowering today. You know, so I think that's more on knowing how your plant grows. And again, that's debatable, of course. I see Chris's smirk starting to smile there. <laughs> but, but it's debatable because the only way you know how to approach your plant is looking at it. Okay, well, flowering is now. So then as it's already flowering, then you could really start to identify the signs that it's finishing and that it's ripening up versus going based on your traditional scale or your timeline of week one to week nine. And these are the times when you'd hit X, Y, Z. You really have to start to understand the plant more when you're changing your traditional uh, time. Same with autoflowers, same with different medias. You got to learn a little bit. It's not just all automatic like a grow box, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, go ahead, Chris. Did you want to adi address that smirk? I totally agree. And, and the reason I would be more, you know, more uh, inclined to go towards a fast flowering is because I want the ability to make the decision when that fast flowering starts to take effect. I want to be able to train it. I want it to be perfect. I want it to look great. I want the tops to be out. I want it to be symmetrical. I want it to fill the tent. These are all things that I needed to do before. 
that it starts to flower. And then with an auto flower, it's like, okay, I am going to bend it. Oh, it's flowering. Oh, dang. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's great... not my, yeah, there, there's no real control there. So still in favor of the fast flowering and having the access to train it to get those big harvests quicker over the yeah. auto flower. Well, you got to think too, is, is the aspect with the, with the fast flowering culture or the photo period, period, you're able to do most of that training in veg. So if you know it's n- going to be a fast flowering cultivar, like I said, do your work early on, but still need to see how that cultivar takes. Like I'm noticing with this Georgia pie that I've got, it's all low stress training. If I do any topping, it's like it stops growing for a week. I'm like, what's happening here? And then all of a sudden I notice a little piece starting to grow. So it's like each cultivar may be different. So fast flowering saying, well, just scrog it out, do this, do that. It still depends how it grows. I think you still want to treat it like a photo period in sense of training or in sense of all the stuff you do in veg. You know what I'm saying? That's still all the same versus an auto flower that still is unique in how you'd approach that. I still prefer if somebody's trying to get going, you know, I guess auto flower, you don't got to change the light cycle, but I still in my mind prefer to do a fast flower for that person because that extended period of time, someone's going to pull it early often. I see that more times than not. Your first smoke, like Pigeon's biggest tip for most first timers, make sure you have smoke before you try to grow it. Take smoke to grow smoke. Yeah, fast flowing cultivar, that extra couple weeks is that two weeks you pull it too early, like most people. Nine times out of ten, the people I know, they pull it two weeks early. I'm like, ah, oh, if you would have given it two more weeks. It's like, well, luckily for you, you got yourself a fast flowering cultivar. <laughs> you know, like that's that's a good good tip for new growers. Now they're early. Now the people who harvest early are going to be at week four. Like, okay, I think it's ready to harvest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, man. You got to know your plant. Just pistol, just white, stiff <laughs> pistols coming out. <laughs> just all pistols. Yeah, people. Yeah, people take great offense, particularly autoflower growers, when I say and wait for the comments on this because I'm going to say it again uh, that autoflowers are for beginners, and I don't mean any disrespect. I think they're not for beginners. They're great for beginners sorry I, let me reframe because there's some people out there that aren't beginners that are doing some incredible things with autos um I, i've seen it with my own two ass but you know i i do believe though that it, as a beginner you only need one tent you don't need a veg tent you don't need a flower tent you just need one tent you need one light it doesn't have to be a, a hot warm spectrum or cool spectrum it could be a full spectrum and with that one tent you can flower that thing out you don't even need to know when it's going to be big enough you plant it forget it and just water it and essentially it's going to do its own thing so that's why i believe that autoflowers are great for beginners and i think you know they're not for beginners so i think that's maybe where the the misinformation or i said it out of my own mouth so it's not really misinformation but um, people great for you. beginners yeah we should have a separate conversation on that because i disagree and i think Good. we could actually probably do a whole episode on that that would actually be uh we should. I think a lot of people would like that, you know. You know who we should talk to about for that? Beginners. Be Only one. if we're going to fight afterwards. We're going to fight, but I, I <laughs> want to do it with Neil and Heaven when we go out to Vegas, and Neil's mm. on my team. He's a big boy. Mm-hmm. And Heaven, because well, I feel like Heaven's she's on my like team, man. Harley Quinn. She come, you know what I'm saying? So if we, yeah. But I think, honestly, since they've Hacky been growing photos circle. recently, that too. But Throw I really in. feel like the they've now more recently tried photo periods. They'd be the perfect person to to let us know. They they're I mean honestly, uh, a case study because they went from only autos to their first photo and it was like whoa this is totally different, and it's it's I think some people will see the benefits of both. It really just depends on the person, but you can't knock it until you try it. Just make sure you don't let one that doesn't do good for you. Just like for me that um, I didn't like that monster mass at all. I didn't like the smoke at all so i was just kind of turned off from faster flowering cultivars i figured they'd all be like that and i'm like nah and so now i'm seeing how there's so many again seeing grower joe with dozens of different ones i'm like what 40 days 49 what and he's growing gorilla glues and gelatos and all these different cultivars it's changed my whole perspective just like autos so you got to be able to try stuff before you knock it that's a big thing man i think a lot of people uh i don't know if you've um got that like that feeling that you get when you're mid flowering and it's starting to finish you know and i mean maybe it's week five week six and you're seeing things like it's so rapid and uh comparing it to like like i had a fast finishing one pakistan valley in with eight nine weekers uh right next to it and i'm like man this thing's 
finishing quick. It's just exciting. Like the feeling you get from it. It's like almost done with this one. This is great. This is, it's a lot less work too, right? I mean, I mean, the amount of work additional is debatable for a longer flower flowering one, but, uh, um, it's definitely quicker. It's going to, you're going to save time. Um, you know, if you can finish weeks, uh, earlier is definitely a benefit. So, um, we'll do the math, man. You got one to two more cycles because of it. If you, depending on how long you veg, you literally are saving that amount of time where your flowering tank can, can harvest one or two more times per year based on that, that time cut down. You know, it's just like waking up an hour earlier per day. All of a sudden your production increases for the year by a month. It's the same concept as where if you can drop down that flowering time, uh, really optimize your vegging time and get that, that like procedure just really tight. You can be flipping consistently and having your cultivars just back to back to back to back to back in a real short period of time. That's like a perpetual hear, secret. I can hear somebody in the comments already saying, uh, well, if it's a quicker flowering one, that's going to be less yield than you would get with an eight or nine week or even beyond that. What do you guys think about that? Less yield on uh, the shorter flowering ones or what? Yeah, if it's an auto flower because you didn't have time to train it. Uh, if it's a fast flower, you have all day to train it in the veg period. So no, I would argue that no, you don't. If you have enough tops and enough plant to support fruits, the fruits will grow. In an auto flower, you don't have the time in veg. Or, or, or generally, I know some people can get large harvests, but that's a that's an exception to the rule. Uh, generally, people aren't or don't have enough time to veg and train an auto. So yeah, I would I would agree and disagree. I'd say. When you look at it, you either have two more weeks of veg when you flip into flower, or you have two less weeks of flower. Do the math. They cancel each other. You know what I'm saying? So it, it depends. The argument in terms of how much your plant gets out of it is about the same. Because you can decide to veg your plant for the same amount as that photo period. And while that photo period has two more weeks of time, you've given up two more weeks that you're going to your next plant. You know what I'm saying? So I think that the argument is, is dependent on the veg depending on what you do in the veg cycle, because you definitely can knock it out of the park. I mean, even seeing some of the autos I've seen recently, I'm like, whoa, that's an auto? Like, that's insane. But it just depends on, on how they trained it and worked it in the cultivar, absolutely. I think saying one, that's like saying sativas yield more than, than indicas in terms of the, the botanical stance of the plant, not smoke, obviously. I think that people are misunderstanding that first couple weeks of stretch, you know, flower or not, it's not flowering more buds there. It's just vegging more, growing more, so to speak. So I don't know. I don't, the argument doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. What about you, Chris? I've had a lot of uh, the, one, the ones that I've grown seem to just swell up faster than the other plants that are in there, you know, eight, nine weekers or, or beyond. Um, they just seem to be swelling up and, and bigger, faster. And then, of course, transition to the uh, finishing faster as well. So um, I personally haven't like measured it to see, um, but uh, but yeah, I think it's someone's at the same rate. Someone's has. out there with a string, and they wrap it around their bud. But then the argument is, well, did you grow them the same? Did you feed them the same? Did you train them the same? Or the same pheno and all those other arguments that go into all the reasons why it didn't turn out the way that someone in the comment section thinks it should. So. Well, unless I think you're in a commercial of- setting and you're getting it down to the cost per gram that tight. I mean, I'm talking every drop of everything. And that's your time, that's your electricity, your your feeding, all those things. And you can compare those two. It's hard to argue. It's all subjective at the end of the day. You know, because, again, one cultivar is different. The way they did it's different. But if you can say, I'm getting X amount per harvest at this dollar per, per watt, whatever you want to call it. That's a, a better way to measure, in my opinion, because then you're going to say, well, here, because I'm feeding less, because I'm doing less and I'm getting more harvest, I'm having <laughs> lower costs versus the other person who has to veg longer or flower longer, like put in more nutrients, do have more time in there, all these things, you calculate that in, it's going to cost more in the end. And if you look at just cost as freedom chips for time, well, you're sacrificing more freedom chips with a sh- longer flowering, you know, I, I think that's just a short shot to guarantee that but it depends on the cultivar you're looking for it may not be something that's a short flowering thing for me i haven't found many that are are hitting my palate so to speak so i can't say i'm just going to go for those based on that alone i'm i'm a can of sewer baby i'm looking for what i'm looking for i'm glad you brought up like the cost 
impact and and stuff like that i know me as like a home grower just growing for myself like i'm not my mind isn't as much there uh you worked on the commercial facility for well over a year i know that rob um so you probably have to deal with that a lot more often and have that really in the back of your mind the place that let me ask the place that you worked at uh did was there any faster flowering ones is that a practice that they kind of went after was to make sure that they had you know faster flowering or even just eight to nine weekers versus longer ones oh yeah eight uh, weeks period eight weeks or less and if it was anything higher than that again that's why i mentioned it is the cost of nutrients the cost of training for an extra two weeks of somebody in there maintaining the plant in that room the lights being on the the all the equipment running all these things factor into it it's two weeks at the end of the year for a thirty thousand square foot facility that adds up per room you know at a home grow, yeah, you're splitting hairs. It's like the people on TV telling you or on the internet saying, buy a whole chicken and save two cents per chicken breast. It's like, I don't give two cents. My time <laughs> is valuable. You know, so it it can add up, of course. But when you're looking at your resources at home, unless you're an organic, it's costing you more money for nutrients, period. And unless you got solar power or wind power or some alternative, your electricity bill costs more. So longer flowering cultivars, no matter what, are going to cost you more. Like a 12, 14 weeker. Think about that, the amount of extra nutrients and the amount of extra light and the amount of extra fan going, like all these things. So it's, it's dead obvious cost-wise it's going to be better. But in the same with, again, the argument of the autoflower, of one tent, one light, you know, unless you want multiple going, same thing. It's less. But you sacrifice other areas of things, terpenes that don't develop at these younger states, um, potentially cultivars that haven't been bred into faster flowering cultivars, um, or just not knowing about it and not having the knowledge until you watch this episode on From the Stash. You're right. I think the market throughout the entirety of our community and industry throughout the time of this plant has always focused on whatever it takes to get this plant to as many people in the with with the with the fewest amount of restrictions and you know that's that's why skunk was kind of bred out it 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 stunk too much it it didn't work for the market at the time times changed that's kind of coming back fast flowering was a thing because you know in parts of the world where summer never ends then yeah you you have the time to be able to grow those those genetics now in a world where it is 30,000 square foot facilities you have time frames restraints profits margins you have people that are employed that don't even try the product they're just trying to they're just trying to put get it to market and for good or for worse or whatever for better or for worse you know you're gonna see a a transition where i would bet that you will now see a decline in the maui wowies the 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 long flowering strains genetics cultivars if you will and we will we will see that gap come closer and closer together perhaps even favoring the side of of fast flowering based on the market where do we go from here i think that's why we have craft growers home growers to say well i've experimented and i've found that by flowering this out nine ten weeks we do get those untapped terpenes and you get the 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 craft growers that are still trying to harness the power of this plant Whereas, you know, it, it'll be a happy medium. So thankfully we have both parties with the craft and, you know, the commercial can afford to get the science done if, if, if they're willing to do it. So there is, there is place for both, for both. So that's how I ramble. There's one more thing I want to uh, address or, or answer before we end this episode. I should have actually included this in the feeding section, but additives, right? I think a lot of people now know us. Uh, like stash blend? Stash blend. Yeah. We, um, <laughs> So we get a lot of questions in regards to that. I think with the the faster flowering strains, how would we apply additives or specifically stash blend? Uh, for those that don't know, stash blend is a kind of an all-in-one additive uh, powder form that uh, we helped formulate. At least we had uh, you know, we have a scientist working behind the scenes and doing all the the heavy lifting for us, making sure things work. But we were able to give some input on it, and we've been using it in our gardens for the past year and a half now. And um, anyways, this would be fed typically soil drench. So mix it in with water um, and then you can apply that throughout the whole grow. Um, Now, the general recommendation from the scientist who formulated it was that um, cut it off at week six of flowering. You know, you could do that certainly um, same. I would say the same week with the shorter flowering ones. Um, But if you're reusing that soil, you can go all the way up to the end. 
you know so i've been continuing using stash blend once a week i was actually at one point i was doing it every single watering uh, and it was it was great um so yeah if anybody had that question on how to apply stash blend to these faster flowering ones um there's your answer there you can do it all the way up until harvest if you choose so or feel free to cut it off a week or so before harvest it's a really good point Absolutely. thanks for bringing yeah. that up that's where stash blend.com oh, is it if you guys are dot com stash blend.com what a conversation guys this was really cool uh i'm looking forward to the uh uh is or are auto flowers for beginners video look out for that real soon um that'll be uh hitting tube near you unless it's already out unless it's already when out you're watching right. this <laughs> or listening because we're good at that uh yeah. but i want to give a huge shout out to everybody that uh tunes in and heads over to stashmerch.com. we do have a merch line for those that don't know it's got some wicked pieces make sure you go and check that out if you want all the latest news and posts uploads that uh, you might have missed because you don't have your notica- notification bell on go to stash from the uh, go to from the stash dot com. Thank you, thank you. There's yep. so many. I got it. From stash the stash from dot the, com. From um, the don't forget, we do record our smoke sessions that you can see here uh, a few times a month over on Twitch TV slash from the stash. That was a great episode, boys. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, with that being said, it's your boy Rob, Mister Grow It, Pigeon Four Twenty. We'll see you guys next time. Stay lifted. Peace. Peace. Banger. Banger.